All right, guys, so today we're looking at 1.7. This is the last section in Unit 1. Um, we are going to talk about the Constitution a little bit. Now, for those of you that have already taken civics, um, a lot of this is going to be review, and so I don't want to, like, bore you with stuff you've already learned, but it's a good chance to review some stuff that you probably have already talked about. So um, the Constitution is set up into eight parts. Um, it is the preamble, which is the we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, dot, dot, dot. You might have memorized that in fifth grade or something. Um, and then we have the seven articles, okay? Now, what I want to try and point out to you is a very helpful, and this is my... This is my mnemonic device, so if you guys hate this, come up with something better uh, and let me know. Um, but what we've got here is our seven articles, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a mnemonic device um, to help you remember what those are. Okay, so we've got Article 1 that talks about the legislative branch, um, that is L, and then Article 2 talks about the executive branch, aka the president. Article 3 talks about the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, and uh, the federal court system. Article 4 talks about the rights of states. Um, this is going to be kind of followed up with the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, and then Article 5 talks about the amendment process. What does it take to amend this document? Um, Article 6 has something called the Supremacy Clause, which talks about why the Constitution is the most supreme law of the land um, and basically set, establishes that no state court or no state constitution can override the federal constitution. And then our last one here is one that we don't really talk about much in, in uh, politics anymore because it is the ratification process. And that was used at the Constitutional Convention, and that was pretty much the last time anyone's ever thought about it. Um, so we don't really talk about that and, and super important anymore. So uh, the fun acronym I've got for you here is LEJ, L-E-J. I'm just writing with my mouse here. That's, that's not super legible. LEJ SAZER. <laughs> And so, um, you know, if you want to make a fun little mnemonic device for this, like, uh, you know, when biology might have kings play chess on funny green squares to remember your, like, phylum, order, kingdom, all that kind of stuff, um, yeah, come up with something. So I think in the past I had something like uh, Larry eats just salad and sausage regularly. <laughs> you can probably come up with something better, but I'm just doing that right off the top of my head. So um, so that's our acronym here, Ledge Sazer. And if you memorize that, then if I ask you on a quiz, like, hey, what does Article 4 say? Then you'd be able to be like, L-E-J-S. And then you have to remember what part of uh, which S it is. But um, hopefully once you get there, you'll be like, oh, it's the states. Um, but anyway, come up with something and let me know what you come up with. All right, uh, let me erase this and move on. I just want the regular mouse, thanks. Okay, um, some key principles in the Constitution. And these are all things that, again, hopefully you talked about in civics class, but federalism. Federalism is the system where basically we have a federal government and we have state governments. Um, so government powers are split vertically between federal government, state governments. And then we also have the bottom layer, bottom layer of this, if you want to envision a wedding cake, and that is local government. Okay, Cities or counties uh, also have a huge amount of power. Um, in fact, if you had a pothole in 2427, um, that is probably going to be taken care of by your local government, not your federal government, right? The president is not going to come in and personally fill in that pothole, um, nor is any federal agency probably going to because they are dealing with uh, highways, interstate highways. Uh, the next thing we got here is separation of powers. And this is kind of something that people confuse with federalism. Um, but separation of powers says that there will be three branches and that each branch is in, in charge of a specific task or a specific role in government. So the executive branch, their job is to exec, execute the law, exec, I was going to say executive the law, um, execute the law or to make sure the laws are enforced. Um, the legislative branch, their job is to write laws. So that's what people in Congress do. They get elected to write laws to try and help uh, the American people. And then our last branch, the judicial branch, um, is, uh, I went out of order there, legislative, executive, judicial. But the judicial branch, uh, their job is to make sure laws that are signed or created are constitutional. So they're looking at the Constitution and saying, does this law banning free speech in movie theaters uh, violate the Constitution? And if it does, then the Supreme Court will step in and say that law is unjust and they will strike it down. Um, checks and balances is that separation of powers played out in an action. So if the president signs a law by Congress, 
that bans free speech in movie theaters, the Supreme Court will check and balance those other two branches. Um, and so separation of powers and checks and balances are kind of used interchangeably, even though they're not quite the same concept. Um, limited powers of government, this is an important concept because this makes sure that our government can't do whatever it wants. Um, going through the Constitution, you will find that the government has specific things they can do and specific things they cannot do. Um, a lot of the limits on government are found in the Bill of Rights. Um, as we watched in our previous section, 1.6, um, the Anti-Federalists were super vocal about establishing rights that would protect us and rights that would uh, protect things like freedom of speech and freedom of press. Um, the fifth star we got here is popular sovereignty. This is a fancy way of saying that the people have power. Okay, Another way that people usually talk about popular sovereignty is through the concept of democracy. But um, popular sovereignty is really the idea that like laws come from people. And so at the end of the day, the people have the power to change government, not the power or not government having the power to change government. Um, and so the people are sovereign, right? Um, as like a king. Um, and then our system here and the bottom is republicanism. Now we talked about the republic back in uh, earlier in this section, 1.5, I want to say. Um, but republicanism basically says that, similar to federalism, um, that government is fractured and republicanism in this context is people are electing people to go to government for them to carry out the powers of government. Um, in the legislative branch, we elect our members of the House and members of the Senate. In the original constitution, the Senate was selected by either state legislatures or governors. And so that wasn't something that people were given power to select, um, but people were given power to select their representatives to uh, the House of Representatives. Um, one other thing worth pointing out, obviously, is the president is elected by the people. Uh, that sentence is greatly more complicated by the fact that we have something called the Electoral College, which filters the votes of the people. So, um, you know, simplistically, people say, well, this person got more votes, so they should be president. And uh, whether you agree with that statement or not, it's not technically true. Uh, we have elections and everyone tries to get people to vote for their president or their candidate. Um, those are important. Your vote matters. But your vote also affects the Electoral College vote, which is the true count of who wins the presidential election. Um, we will talk about that more in depth. And we'll talk about moments in American history where the Electoral College doesn't necessarily carry out the will of the people and where, you know, the founding fathers may have thought it was a cool idea, but maybe didn't anticipate it being used in a certain way in certain cases. Um, certain powers in, of the federal government that are limited powers and specific powers here. Uh, these are different titles for different powers. So I'm going to try and explain this in a short way that is simple. Enumerated powers, they are found in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Um, when you guys get your pocket constitutions and you flip to that Article 1, Section 8, you will see it's not quite bulleted, but you'll see it's kind of written out as if it is a list of, uh, it's an enumerated list of things that the government can do. Um, and this is in Article 1. So if you go back to our acronym, that is the legislative branch. Um, concurrent powers describe powers held by both federal and state governments. Now, I'm going to give away the question here. It says, like what? Um, usually, if I did this in class, I would ask for an example. What is something the federal government has the power to do and state governments? Um, the most simple one is pass laws. But the most uh, visible one that you probably think of or probably experience on a day-to-day -day basis is tax. Um, in April of every year, the federal government says, you owe us taxes if you have an income, and states collect taxes in a variety of ways as well. So both collect income taxes um, and state governments will also have sales tax. Um, so concurrent powers describe powers that the federal and state governments both have. Powers that are just for the states are called reserved powers. Think about it, it's in a closet, it is reserved for just the states to use. Um, anything that typically has a license with it is a reserved power, something that states do. So if you think about, you got a driver's license, your driver's license did not come from the federal government, it came from the state of North Carolina. So driving is something that the states have said, these are rules that we will make. Um, there is no federal driving laws that you have to follow. They're all state laws. Um, and you can kind of see this play out as well when you see certain states have speed limits that are higher than others. Um, if you're a motorcyclist in North Carolina, you have to wear a helmet. But if you cross the border into South Carolina, you don't have to wear a helmet. So states handle those kinds of laws. 
Um, also marriages, um, marriages involve licensing. And so states can craft their own laws on marriage uh, restrictions. Um, also voting rights uh, are left to the states. Now the federal government has outlined certain things that states cannot do related to voting rights. Um, a lot of that deals with issues of racism that have happened in the past where white politicians in the South that were racist said, we don't want this group of people to vote. And so they made things very hard for them. And the federal government over time has uh, criminalized that and said, look, if you're trying to make a specific group of people, uh, if you're trying to make it harder for them to vote because you're racist, then you are in violation of the law now. So that took uh, many years to get passed through Congress because some of those racist politicians that were denying people the right to vote were getting elected and sent to DC. Then when it came up for discussion, those members would say, well, there's nothing wrong here. We are simply following through with the powers that our people of our states sent us to DC to do. And so uh, when people think racistly and elect politicians that are acting racistly, uh, then a racist system exists. Um, and so that's what we're gonna see as we get closer to things like the end of slavery and things like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s. Um, the last one here is implied powers. And this is one that if you ask anti-federalists, they're going to turn red in the face and start, you're, you're going to see steam come out of their ears because what these are, are powers that are not specifically listed in the constitution. Now, anti-federalists don't like these because anti-federalists want specific powers written down. They don't want the government to just decide one day, um, let's make some rules about what TV stations can broadcast. They say, well, hang on a second. If you look at the constitution, there is no mention of the word television and therefore the federal government cannot do anything about that. Um, but as we've seen, and I mentioned television for the specific reason that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, limits what can go on TV and what can go on the internet and what can go on radio. And you might have a favorite song that is uh, bleeped out on the radio, but when you listen to it on Apple Music or Spotify, you hear all the cuss words. That is something the federal government is involved with. Um, now in Jefferson and Washington and Hamilton's day, obviously there was no radio, there was no television, there was no internet. So that's something that over time when technology develops, the federal government says, is this something we're gonna to need to monitor? And increasingly the answer to that is yes. So those are our uh, powers of Congress, powers, not just powers of Congress, but powers of the federal government. And in the case of reserved and concurrent, also state governments. Um, the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. These are the ones that are most often cited. Um, and certainly the one that you've probably heard of most is the First Amendment, followed closely by the Second Amendment. We're going to talk about some amendments that you might not have heard about as much, and we're going to go through those in more detail. Um, but Rhode Island is uh, the last state to sign. And surprise here, North Carolina is the second last to sign the Constitution. Um, it's a little interesting, too, because um, in the ratification process, which is Article 7 of the Constitution, um, it only takes 9 out of 13 for this document to be ratified, which is to be approved. So New Hampshire signs at 9th, North Carolina signs at 10th, uh, or sorry, New Hampshire signs at 9th, North Carolina signs at 12th, and Rhode Island signs at 13th. But by the time North Carolina and Rhode Island sign this, it's already in effect. Um, it's a little too late to stand up and say, this is wrong, we're not gonna sign this document because the ninth state that signed it made it go into law. Um, our current constitution has 27 total amendments. Now that is the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, plus an additional 17. Now, if you think about that, that is essentially 17 additional amendments over the last, I don't know, I can't do math this quickly, but since 1787, right? So what is that, 100 and, uh, 240 almost years um, where we've only added 17 additional amendments. Um, so that's not really that bad when you consider that the constitution was written in this 1787 and we've only changed it uh, 17 times since then. Um, so as a document, it is not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. And I mentioned this in the previous section, but our constitution is one of the oldest in the world. So. Um, it is not a perfect document, but again, it has done pretty well to stand up to the, uh, the sands of time, if you want to phrase it that way. Um, we've also had two amendments that contradict each other. So uh, the 18th Amendment went in 
to effect, um, which banned the sale of alcohol. And then the 21st Amendment overrode the 18th Amendment, which banned the ban on alcohol. So those two amendments, uh, if you really want to analyze the amendments and how many changes we've had, they kind of cancel each other out. Um, and so, yeah, our Constitution, not that many changes to it. Um, we will talk about all these amendments briefly, and we'll kind of add them as we go through the course. So I'll mention them up top here. We'll talk about all the amendments, um, and I'm going to have you guys make a little booklet on them. And then we're going to talk about once they're in place uh, throughout history. So um, I don't have any questions for you on this section, but um, on the quiz, just make sure you're aware of the articles and your amendments as well. Okay, thanks for watching, and uh, I appreciate y'all.